One, two, three. Welcome to Scale Down. My name is Joe Austin. I want to remind those who are listening to us tonight or watching us tonight that Scaled is a joint production between Felch Appears to Hear and the Fail and Fumble. If I was to recommend the book that was written by the man I'm about to interview to tell you about growing up in one of the most depraved parts of any city in this island, from nearly from kind of struggling to grow up to becoming uh, an actor, to winning all kinds of accolades, to be rubbing shoulders where the great and good of that of that grouping of people from the Attenboroughs to the Spielbergs to all of those people. If I was to recommend that as a book, you wouldn't buy it because you wouldn't believe it. Well, he, Martin didn't write the book. He lived the life, the life. So my guest tonight is Martin McCann. So Martin, maybe that's slightly an exaggeration of your early days in the, the Davis complex. So you did come up from Davis. So tell us a wee bit about that. I guess, uh, I guess both, uh, both, uh, both opposite ends of the spectrum can be, you know, romanticized, you know, film, TV, media, you know, there's a lot of sort of, uh, romanticization that goes along with it and also coming from Divis Flats can also be romanticized um, in terms of you know hardship struggle I mean when I was a kid I didn't know any different you know so there was no it didn't seem like hardship or struggle to me I mean I remember knocking about the flats and the balconies and bringing out the rubbish and, and down to the communal rubbish chute and throwing out you know bins down the road I, I just thought that was that was normal obviously the smell of pee from the crayon stirs and um but i was happy i had a happy childhood and uh um i was a little bit of a dreamer probably a little bit of a loner to, to a certain extent um but i remember the divis flats vividly i remember old cars being burnt out and you know i'm 37 you know i'm not i'm not 67 but i do remember yeah. i do remember um my childhood being in, in divis flats and um, that that aesthetic would make for a great um, a great cinema piece, um, you know, because it's just it's uh, many a story. Um, I don't think if they made a film about Davis Flats that they could get it quite right, you know. It's that complex, and there's that many characters, as they say. But um, but I never knew that I was going to become an actor or anything like that. I always loved watching people on TV and pulling funny faces and funny accents and stuff like that. Uh, and maybe, I don't know, maybe it was because I, I don't know, I was a little bit of a dreamer, a little bit of a dreamer. I, I know you're filming in Dublin and you've taken time out to be with us tonight. So listen, that's, we much, we appreciate that very much. We, we were talking to, to your brother, Stephen, just to try and get a, cause I, I, I've never met you before, although, I have seen you in a variety of stuff that you've acted. But I, we were asking him about your personality and just to get a feed for the interview. And he said that you were very observant, that you could watch a film, you could watch a, a, a program on TV, and you would remember and recall all of it. You would recall the, the good parts, the bad parts, the nuances of it. So you said earlier on about being a dreamer. Did you ever dream you were going to become an actor? Um, I, it wasn't my intention. I remember, uh, I really didn't know what I wanted to be. I love film. I love TV. And I remember doing my first play as you will in school. And I guess that I just felt comfortable on stage and I, and it's, it sounds strange, but you get a sense of when things are going well on stage and when they're not going so well and i loved that i loved whether it was real or imagined i loved the the notion that i could improve what was happening within the play depending on how i performed the play um and almost sense whether the audience is switched on or switched off and that in and of itself no fame, no money, nothing like that. I just loved that element. I guess in a sense it was probably for the first time I felt, oh, I can do this. 
and I can control this and I can work towards being better at this. So really the craft of it was what interested me. And I was very young. I had no idea how I could do it as a profession. There was no dreams of doing it as a, prof as a profession or making money or making a living from it. But I just enjoyed the process. And obviously one thing led to another and it became a job. I think for many people, when you talk about successful actors, male or female, you cannot come up with a, a Billy Elliot type character, especially if it's a working class setting, it's a working class background. But you weren't a pushy child. You weren't someone who had to be in the middle of everything. You, you're described but to me as a kind of a, an observer of, of events rather than always needing to be in the middle of them. Is, is that a fair description of you? I, I, I think I was a little bit of an outsider. Um, was I shy? No. They say that acting is uh, the shy man's revenge, you know? So you get on stage and you, you be and wreak havoc the way you wouldn't normally have the courage to do so in real life. Um, I, I, I felt like an outsider. I, was a, I think I was a confident child, but I was never... I, uh, if I attention seeked, it was through performance and not by standing in the middle of the crowd being, you know, being the center of attention with my yeah, mates. No, you yeah, the no. The project was really in terms of after or outside of school, the Rainbow project was something that you took to, to like, duck the water. Is it? I, I loved it. I mean, I, certainly there was nobody in my family who were actors and it was a strange sort of, or, or even interested in acting. And it was really seen, I guess, as something that girls were into, you know, which I was reminded of on several occasions. What are you doing that for? Only girls do that. But what they didn't know was that there was more pretty girls down there doing it, you know? So, you know, you got the pick, pick of the, pick of the bunch, you know, but, um, I, I went to Rainbow Factory. My mum sent me out and put me in a, a black taxi, sent me down Falls Road. I went into the Rainbow Factory and hadn't a clue what it was about. Seen these kids singing and dancing. And, and so the singing and dancing really wasn't for me. I was more interested in the, in, the, um, in the acting side of things. But it wasn't a professional body. You know, it was started by a guy called Brian Drain. And it was originally started as a dance school, which then sort of morphed into a, a drama and dance and it was a cross community project to bring young catholic and protestant kids from either side of the of the fence um together through something constructive creative artistic and i seen kids come in who were shy and leave rainbow factory more sort of developed young adults able to express themselves more clearly and just their self-esteem and confidence increased so it was not for people who wanted to be actors. It was for people who wanted to meet friends and uh, grow as, as young adults. You, you mentioned your mother putting you into, putting you into the taxi and, and, and she was instrumental, of course, in getting you your first part, your first, the Artful Dodger, I believe, was, a, was the breakthrough that you were looking for. You're, you're, you're quite close to your mother. I am quite what was the reaction when, when you told the family, you know, I'm going to be an actor? Because there was no acting in the family. To be honest, I think it wasn't a, you know, it wasn't a, everyone sit down, um, you know, my name's Martin and I'm going to be an actor, you know, like an, <laughs> AA, like an AA meeting for actors. Yeah. It wasn't like that. It sort of just progressed. And I think as long as I was staying out of trouble, I think my mother and father were, were happy. and. I, I had support from my family. Um, there was never any pressure to do or be anything. It was just stay out of trouble. Stay out of trouble and that, you know, you're, you're doing all right. And I think that's the case. Um, that's, that's the case of growing up, I, I think, in, in Divis Flats. There was no real pressure to be or to achieve. or The pressure was just, just don't bring trouble around the door. That, that, that's the difference. I've I've heard people in, in your profession talk about that buzz, that that kind of like something inside is activated. 
when you're on the stage, when you're looking at an audience, when they're looking back at you, and you say it in a way when you know that your performance or, or what you do will make or break, you know, any anything that you're involved in. First of all, is that true? Does it happen like that? Or is that feeling? Well, you're only as good as the actor you're acting alongside. Um, and the play is only as good as the script that you're acting in, you know. Uh, but there are things that the actor can do to keep the energy up and keep the pace up. Um, small little things. And it's not that you're intentionally doing it. You know, you can feel with the, when the audience is, is engaged. You can feel when you're having a good night. Um, and whether it's real or imagined, you know, some actors come off and they go, wow, that was, a, that was a great performance. We had them in the palm of our hands there. And people come out and they say it was a great theater play or a great show. Or, and sometimes you go and you do a play, maybe you're half switched on. And, or, uh, you know, so really depending on, well, it's called performance for a reason. You know, you perform and you perform at different levels on different nights, depending on your, your mental or emotional state. And, um, and I like that idea of performing. I guess it was a sense of, um, it was a sense of uh, achievement when you give your all to the play, you know? Um, I was never, I liked football, but I was never a great footballer. I did a little boxing, but I didn't stick at it. I wasn't really good. Um, and when I say boxing, like I, you know, went to Maculata for a few weeks, yeah. I got the head punched off me and then left. Um, <laughs> but, uh, so that was my, that was my kettle of fish. The Artful Dodger, of course, you know, Oliver and, and Dickens and one of the, one of the uh, spectacular films of the 60s and all of that. Um, were, did, do you, did you find inspiration from the film? Did you develop your own Artful Dodger? Did you, did you have the character in your head? Did you create him? I, uh, I, I, well, bear in mind, this was my first theatre play. I was very yeah. young, so I, I watched the film several times. And, but even at that age, I thought, I'm not going to copy that guy. I don't want to copy him because I felt like that would be cheating, you know. So it was a good, a good artist, a bad artist copies, a good artist steals. So I just stole some stuff and uh, tried the old uh, Cockney accent and more so got the essence of the character, you know, his little sort of cocksuredness, his confidence, his cheekiness, and um, always conniving, always scheming, always thinking about where the next couple of quid was coming from, even when you were talking to him. He was always just his mind was going a, a million miles an hour. And he was a live wire. But deep down inside, he really actually did care for Oliver because he maybe yeah. seen Oliver. He's seen a little bit of himself in Oliver, a lost boy who um, who really, really was in a world that um, maybe he saw in Oliver that, he, that Oliver could get out of this world um, and want, wanted him to get out, wanted yeah. to protect him until he got out, even though it was unsaid. Whereas Fagan was very much, you know, get the kid and turn him into the Artful Dodger, make your money and then be done with him. So um, even at a young age, I, I, I understood the different dynamics, interpersonal relationships between the characters and who wanted what, what wanted who, and, and the, the motives and the passions of each individual character, how each individual character behaves to each other individual character, you know, the hierarchy, the power, the, and all that started to intrigue me. And I went, oh, there's a, there's a whole big myriad uh, of complexity in these white pages with the words on them that you can uh, paint. You, you talked about the misconception sometimes. Um, when we talk about actors, or for most people, when you talk about actors, especially someone who's reached the, the heights of their profession as you have, you you talk about you tend to think of the glory of it or or the success of it or what success brings and that can be many different things but there's a for me i think there would be a, a fear factor so like playing a part especially so young as you say and especially when it's your first big you know 
forte onto the stage. You were you frightened? Were you was was the fear as strong as the wanting to be successful? Uh, I think you are frightened and and sort of a little bit of stage fright, um, and that goes directly. Um, in line with how prepared or underprepared you are. So if you don't know your lines and you didn't really work well in rehearsal and you're not too sure about what you're doing, I think the fear factor can be through the roof because all you want to do is perform well. You want to give a good show. You, wanna, you, want to, you want your director to come and say, you know, well done, that was a great show when you performed everything that we did and taught and the audience loved it. And if you're underprepared and you're not sure of your lines, you can be, it can fill you full of dread or impending doom, you know? So, um, I will, and a few times I've experienced that where maybe I didn't work as hard or, you know, you, you, you have dreams of remembering or completely forgetting your lines going on on stage. You know, these are, you know, some of the fear-based dreams <coughs> around it, you know? But, you know, if you have to go out on stage for an hour and a half and just before you go out, you go, what am I saying? What am I doing? You know, that's, four, that's, four, that's terrifying. Four hundred, four or five hundred eyeballs sitting in silence, yeah. staring, staring at you in a room where you can hear a pin drop. Um, so there are, but I think a little bit of anxiety and a little bit of fear keeps you on your toes and helps uh, to uh, motivate you towards getting it right. Did Oliver was Oliver the stamp on the envelope? Did Oliver? saying your fate was that i am now this isn't school i am now a that poor i think so i think so i think uh i probably viewed the world a little bit differently from that play because it was such a great experience and i had a sense of what i was and what i wanted to be and what i wanted to do and it's great for my self-esteem especially at that age having done a play and having achieved it and um, haven't been successful at it and gives a young person a great sense of achievement and accomplishment. And obviously they want, they want more of that, you know? So the love of the craft and also a sense of fulfillment and achievement, um, and something that I could measure, you know, you do this, you work hard at that and that happens. You know, so it was my real sense, my real first sense of um, really committing to something for an extended period of time and um, achieving success at it, and I loved it. Where did where did that? I know you eventually were you you done a, a whole series of sketches, local sketches, and then of course you done the ring and all that. But what did Oliver lead to? What was immediately in the other side of Oliver? Ah. Uh, uh, I, uh, that, that was the rainbow factory. Yeah. That was the rainbow factory and the rainbow factory kept me, kept me interested in drama. Um, kept me around people who talked about drama. Um, kept me doing all, all amateur, uh, plays in the group theater. Um, to say, um, the Ulster hall. So that was our little theater. Yeah. Um, and we would put on different shows, um, uh, Bugsy Malone, um, The Crucible. I mean, we were all very young, but we all put on the gray wigs and put the makeup on and did. So you were being introduced to even some material that was going over your head, you know, like an Arthur Miller play. And you're going, I haven't a clue what they're talking about. But, but you would slowly, you would pretend that you knew what everybody was talking about long enough until you did actually know what everybody was talking about. Is it a, you mentioned earlier on the Rainbow Factory was good for a number of, a number of reasons, not, most, not least of all for, for kids coming in who built their character or, or give them confidence or been part of a troop uh, and moving from from your first role to, as you say, the Crucible, which I I have read a thousand times and still find a different answer to it every time I read it. But did you make friends? Were you were you introduced to a, a broader audience than those that you grew up with in the flats? I did. I did. I met I met new friends from both sides of the divide, and 
um, and remain friends to them even to this day. Uh, so I had a, almost like a second click or a, a second tribe um, other than the one that I grew up with. So that kind of felt, I sometimes felt like I was living this double life, you know, this life with my, with my acting and my acting friends and also this life of running around Divis getting up to no good, you know. Um, so that, that kept it, that, there was two sides to the track for a long time for me, you know. So there was always the, always the, um, I never wanted to quit acting, but there was always the, ah, you know, take nothing seriously and go out and get up to a bit of mischief um, or um, get the head down, hang around with your acting friends and, and read plays and, and do stuff that's actually proactive and productive for your life. Yeah, and thankfully that was the, that was the route that you took. I said earlier on in the introduction that you had met with and you became friends with, I'm told, with uh, Dickie Attenborough. Yes. How, how did that come about? I did a, a Anthony Burgess a theatre play in Belfast, a Clockwork Orange. Um, it was part of the Belfast Theatre Festival and Film Festival. And, and uh, one of the producers came along and sit and watched the play. And I played Alex um, in A Clockwork Orange. Um, and I'm sure you've watched the film. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> and the, the producer said to me after, look, we're coming to Belfast. And this is really at the start of... Obviously, there have been, been large projects made in Belfast, but Closing the Ring was the start of this film industry, really, that came to Northern Ireland um, over the last wee while that ultimately led to HBO, Game of Thrones, and all that. Um, but she says, look, I'm, we're uh, turning Maysfield Leisure Centre into a film studio, and et cetera, et cetera, and Richard Attenborough is coming over. I'd like you to meet him. And I, I hadn't a clue who Richard Attenborough was. I mean, the only time I'd seen him was in Miracle on 34th Street and, yeah. you know, being Santa Claus. And, and then I went, oh, I, the guy from uh, Jurassic Park. Oh, I, class. Little did I know he was, you know, a screen legend and yeah. Oscar winner, multiple, multiple uh, Gandhi and, yeah. and really part of the, uh, I don't know, you could say, um, the fabric of British cinema for a long time. He was part of the, the of the establishment of it. He was yes, established time. definitely, definitely. Um, I met him, and a lovely mom. You couldn't have met a nicer mom. Peaceful, calm, and um, made me feel at ease. And um, asked me had I done acting before, and you know he was considerably old at this stage and I said yes and he says well what did, what did you just recently do and I had just done that sketch show for the BBC you played a I, said, I played a priest and all sorts Very of priest. that came back to me yeah. uh, all sorts of small stupid comedic characters and I says to, to Richard Attenborough he says well and what character did you play in that and I I, I, I just looked at him and I went I actually played 27 characters <laughs> and he must have thought I was insane. And he went, bless him, he went, oh, 27, wow. <laughs> who, the, who plays 27 characters seriously? Like, you know what I mean? But, um, but I was probably just nervous. And didn't know what to say. But, um, and lo and behold, we sit down, we read and do a few things. And, and then I'm in Canada with, you know, Pete Postlewit, Shirley MacLaine, Christopher Plummer, Dickie Attenborough, you know, crazy Brenda Fricker, uh, Nev Campbell, and uh, young actress Misha Barton. And we, we're in Canada for two months, and we're, we're here for a month, and we're filming this big film. It wasn't a commercial success or Dickie's finest by any stretch of the, the names, but, um, but it was his last film, you know, and... and, and Reflecting back on what he, what he taught me and the experience I had with him, um, it was a surreal experience. You know, every day I'd wake up, and you know, it was only weeks before I was out, probably running around Devis Flats, you know, 
you, you rolled off a number of, of, of uh, very, very internationally known actors and globally known actors just up at the top of your tongue there. How, how, how did you find these people? I mean, were they kindly? Were they just very kindly? And, uh, you know, I was, I was the young cub in the, in, in the group. And, and not only that, you know, I was young, but I had a baby face. I looked even younger. So I guess they all were quite paternal or wanted to look after me and gave me an easy time. Um, but this particular project was a special uh, project. Not many are like it because uh, the, the director was old and everybody just wanted to be there to impress Dickie and be part of this wonderful experience. So that was definitely the warmest, most special set I've ever been on. Um, and maybe it was a case of me being young and being from Belfast and them knowing that I hadn't done much before. Everyone was extra nice and extra kind to me. And I got quite close to Pete Postlethwaite and we were like, you know, a wee double act on that. I just hang, hung around with him everywhere. Um, he would go, he had recently lost his brother on that film set and I, he didn't, didn't mention it or certainly didn't, you know, uh, let it hold him back. But, uh, but I did notice that he, he, he was, drinking every day i just thought it was so strange you know we would have four or five guinness in the morning and um some at lunchtime but he had just recently like a few days before the film started um his brother had passed away quite quite badly of cancer so there was things going on that i obviously me being young that obviously was, were being hidden from me so i just loved it as as a as an experience but as i got a little bit older and went from film set to film set you realize that actually film sets can be stressful and uh, pol political and with so much money being invested and so little time um can be uh, can be a challenge and then you have uh you know actors vying for position and directors bullying and stuff like that i've never really had any bad bad experiences but in terms of that experience nothing comes quite close to how lovely it was. You mentioned there you were nearly nearly living a double life, you know, one foot in Divis. Uh, the McCann's are a very close family, mm -hmm. and one foot on stage or one foot on in a film set. And this occasion you're you're in Canada. Mm -hmm. Did you were you lonely? Was it hard being a young guy away from home and you know, I said you're very close to your mother and father, and of course you are. But was was that a difficulty for you? I I didn't feel lonely. You know, I was just glad to get out and get away. And I've always had a little bit of a nomadic temperament and love to get away. I'm not afraid of traveling on my own and um, being alone with myself for extended periods of time. I've always done that, you know. Um, so it suited me. I loved it. And I really had the sense, little did I know, I didn't foresee the challenges that being an actor would bring, you know, the months and months without work or, you know, the financial hardship or the struggles in London. And, you know, so really I was introduced early to this sort of, you know, dream scenario where you're working with all these greats and, um, you know, looking back, you know, I, and, and as well, they were paying me and, you know, I'd never had any money before in my life and now they're giving me a chunk big wad of cash and you know and, and i'm traveling and i'm you know and i'm one of the lead roles in this you know so it was you know upon reflection if i knew then what i know now you go actually you'd have you'd have realized that that that's that experience is a one-off and this is a job and there is going to be ups and there is going to be downs. Um, and unless you're an actor, it's hard to explain or describe what it takes to be an actor. It's not like a boxer where you're in the gym and you're training and you're training and you're training. And then you have a scheduled fight coming up. It's more a case of um, the time that you wait and you have to fill your time. And then you put all this effort into trying to get a job only to not get it and knowing that 
that it'll be another three or four months where you're trying to get the next job. So it's trying to keep your mental and emotional health in check and trying not to make um, your profession as an actor a referendum on the quality of your life. And I think it takes a wee while. Certainly it took me a long time to learn that because when I was introduced to acting, it was not that it was handed to me on a plate or a platter. I'd done a lot of theater since I was a child. So if anybody was going to get a film at 20, um, it, it, could have, or it could have or should have been me as I had done so much theater yeah. uh, in the past, as opposed, to no one, as, some, as opposed to someone who had never done theater and got the role. So I, what I'm saying is I, I, I earned my stripes up to that point, but no one sits you down and goes, this is actually how acting really is. Um, it's quite challenging. Um, there'll be ups and there'll be downs. You know, when you're 20, you believe it's always going to be like that. You're always going to be on a Richard Attenborough movie traveling around the world with money in your pocket. But it doesn't work like that. Well, strangely, you're saying that. I mean, I, I have just at my fingertips a whole prolific set of pages that are telling me all the successes and the Irish Bat, all that sort of stuff that you know better than I do. And I'm going to go through nearly all of it and what the hour will permit with you. But... When you listen and you look at a successful actor like yourself, it is the success you see. You don't see um, the rejection. And I would imagine, you know, training to get ready for an audition, it must be very intense. And then to go and not get it must be, for me, I don't know about for you, you're probably made of, made of tougher stuff than me, but for me, it would be just an absolute rejection. It would, it would rack me. I, I wouldn't come out of the house for months after. So. Is it a case when that does happen that you, you pull yourself up by their, their shoelaces? Perhaps so. I, I, I mean, you get better at it with time, but um, when you're young and you're hungry and you're passionate and you want all the roles in the world and, you know, it takes you two or three or four weeks to prepare. Sometimes audition, the, the audition process can be a month or two months long to get to the final, final stage where it's you and, you and another guy or you and two or three other guys your age and you're sent packing. Um, and you know, maybe it's another three months of no work and you know, you put in so much and you traveled, you traveled to work wherever it was. Sometimes they don't pay your flight. So you have to foot the bill for that. And so it can be not physically exhausted, but exhausting, but mentally and emotionally you have to be sort of, and they say, well, you know, don't attach yourself to the outcome of whatever happens, happens, and it's for you, it's for you. But you see, you have to attach yourself yeah. to it because if you don't, then you won't work hard enough to try and get it. Yeah, yeah, sure. So you have to want, so you have to want it. And if you want it and you lose it, there's going to be some repercussion for that. Um, and it's not that you're losing any one particular job. It's that um, if you say to somebody who's not an actor, you know, prepare, do a job interview, once every couple of months, but spend the eight weeks preparing for the interview and do that two or three times a year and be told no at each interview and have no work. Um, that's, that's the reality of, of being an actor. And at any given time, less than I think 5% or 10% of actors are working. So there's 90% of them out there trying to, get a, trying to get a job. That's just the way it is. I want to talk. I can't talk to you about every individual film. You're in too many, so I want to just kind of jump and flavour it and try and get a sense of it. I want to talk about my boy Jack, um, yes. which is a Roger Kipling uh, story of his son who who died during the First World War. Kipling, as you know, and you you know this the part better than me, but Kipling was and can be described as a war monger. Uh, he was very much supportive of the First World War very much supportive of the British activity in South Africa and he loses his son and that's heartbreaking no matter what is. But do you leave, do you leave a film or a, or a play or a drama, do you leave part of you behind when you leave that? You, you mentioned about becoming absorbed in what's in front of you and when you finish does it just finish clean, cleanly or is it like kind of part of you still there? 
Uh, well, you have these method actors like Daniel Day Lewis and all that that give their all. And You're much better. Uh, <laughs> no, I, 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 uh, I, I, I just. I don't do anything like that. I, I don't method act. I just kind of go with my instinct and stuff. Maybe, maybe I should do that. Maybe, I, you know, sometimes, you know, if I did it, I probably would be as successful as them guys. But I, I have my thoughts and opinions on that. No matter how much I try to, you know, I could drive around in a taxi all day. I know I'm not a taxi driver. And I, I can already drive. Do you know what I mean? So I think... You know, Robert De Niro driving around in a taxi all day for taxi driver. But then again, you know, he's Robert De Niro and um, you can't really knock him. It's just not not for me. But And even if I started to do that style of acting now, I'd know it would be a lie because it's not something I do. So I would feel I was doing it on just to copy those guys and stuff like that. But, you know, each actor has their own method and... Um, you know, it is it is what it is, but that's 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 all in the prep. In terms of leaving a part of me behind, not really. I I if I did that method acting, it would maybe distress me so much because I got so into the role and you lose a, you, you hear actors saying that that they lose a little bit of themselves coming out of the each project. I personally don't get that. I what I lose is the connection with the people that I met and, and met so intensely. And then they're gone. And sometimes they're gone for the rest of your life. And these are people you work with for three or four months and you see every day and you become best friends because they're like your new sir, your, your new family. Yeah. And then you leave them and they go back to their country and a few texts or a few emails, or but they're gone, you know, yeah. and that's what you lose. So you, but it's also what you gain. Um, by this stage, you, you are not only an actor, you're a highly successful actor. Belfast is too small, I, I suspect, for work, for employment. It's not, I know that we have developed a fairly healthy film industry as a kind of a, a product, but do you, did you move out of Belfast? Did you move traveling, looking for work? I lived in London for five or six years. Um, I lived in Dublin for a few years. Um, I've traveled obviously with work, um, but I moved back to Belfast because, you know, home is where the heart is and I missed my family and um, I don't know, I'd, I'd spent long enough away, you know. I'd Can I ask you, how, how particularly hard was London for, for a young man chasing work and, and away from his family and, and all of that? It was challenging uh, because, well, I didn't have much money, so I was always skint. I was always running from tube to tube, the audition to audition. So, and it can be quite a lonely, harsh city, yeah. you know, yeah. for, for a young actor. And, but it took me a little while to build up a social circle and, and um, worked in several bars um, and, you know, made enough to scrape by. But the rent, the rent was crazy, you know, and... Uh, but I found my feet eventually. And then when I found my feet, I went, all right, I've had enough here, you know. Um, so it was challenging. It was challenging. I, I wouldn't like to live in London, you know. Um, maybe under different circumstances. Uh, but it's not somewhere that appeals to me. I like getting into the car here and zooming up to my dad's or just going for a coffee and parking the car. Or phoning a mate and saying I'll be around in five minutes. You can't do them things in London. You need to prep. You need to prepare. You need to phone your mate and say, "What are you doing today?" And they go, "Well, like I've got a, I've got ten minutes tomorrow on Thursday." Well, I don't know what I'm doing for ten minutes tomorrow. On th you know, so living in a big city like that, yeah, the spontaneity is taken away. And also, I love driving. I love being able to get in my car and just go out into the countryside. I love that. That's one of the small things. No matter what is going on in my life, nobody can take that from me. I can get into my car and I can go out and I can go for a walk in the countryside. And that's a, that's a big thing for me. I'm going to ask you a question. I'm, I'm asking you without trying to embarrass you. Um, can you recall when somebody, you talked about your mates and having the freedom of, of just doing what you do. Uh, can you remember when someone first said, I know him. He was in a film I seen. 
Um, no, no, I can't, <laughs> I, can't, I can't remember the first time. I mean, I, I remember a lot of people looking at me and copying the trendy priest when he's on the phone and he does that thing with his tongue, you know, and uh, yeah. a lot of people did do that to me, but, um, but now, now, now it happens, it happens rarely enough, but when it does happen, somebody will be nice and go, oh, I watched that thing on Netflix or I watched that thing. And, but, um, you know, it's certainly, it's certainly, it, you know, I don't get a big reaction or anything like that, you know, and it's just nice if somebody watches something that you're in and goes, oh, I watched that thing, you were, and I really enjoyed it. You go, thanks a minute, I appreciate it. And that's it. You're quite a modest person, I have to say, and you're quite centered in your life you're, you know anybody that i've, I've spoken to uh, about you or anybody who have said in the last few days when you confirmed that you were going to be available today um, but anybody i've spoken to you went yeah his guy's dead on yeah he's, he's yes yeah, paul drew that's what he is he and he acts a bit is there is there a danger in the celebrity that that is imposed upon you and you, i want to talk a wee bit about your experience with uh, Steven Spielberg, just just very briefly, but is there is there a period, is there a danger for you for a young actor that you begin to live the myth, and you kind of a do all the bad things, do all the things that 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 come with notoriety, that come with money, that come with fame. Is that a, is that something that that drags you in if you're not careful? I think if you Certainly from my experience, I think if you have any notion or idea that acting or your career, whether it be successful or unsuccessful, is going to bring you lasting fulfillment or real, true value to your life, it's a small part of your life that if not kept in check, can grow to be too large and you, you can become obsessed with it and other things fall by the wayside. And when other things fall by the wayside, like your family or your values or your health or anything like that, you feel that and something is out of balance. And when something's out of balance in your life, you may turn to drink or drugs or anything yeah. to quell any emotional upset that you have. So I don't think anybody actively sets out to, you know, go down that bad route when they're in, when they, when they get into a profession such as acting. But I think the profession can foster or um, allow to grow an imbalance in one's life if it's not kept in check, if it's not... Uh, if it becomes consuming for the individual, and yeah. as I say, they make it a referendum on how happy they are or how successful they are in their life, then I think that they're, they're in for a bad time because acting will be up and it will be down. And if you tie your emotions to it, you will be up and you will be down all the way neglecting these other things that are important because you're so obsessed and fixing this thing that goes up and goes down. So it's not really, you know, but no one tells you this. No one tells you this. You know, it's almost like a, uh, it, ca it, can, it can take over things and it can consume your time. Um, and you can neglect what's really important in your life, you know. 2011, <clears throat> you won me the, the Irish... Bath the Academy Awards. Um, was that kind of great? I'm here. I've got it. I'm Irish. I'm, I'm my own, my own wee house. I'm my own wee country, and, I'm, and people are acknowledging that I'm, that I'm, I can act a bit. Yeah, I can do okay. Aye, it was, it was great. I mean, I felt good. I was on top of the world and all that. And, uh, um, but the funny thing about that award is, is that it doesn't bring you any more work. You know, it, it's fancy and it's lovely and when you win it, and, but it's all a bit of shoulder rubbing and back patting and 
But when you're in the middle of it, you know, you're loving it and loving life. But realistically, it's a big paperweight. It doesn't do anything. But with time, it's like, like a new car. The shine wears off. And then you're back to going, where's my next job? Yeah. You yeah. know? So it's a great night out. And you have to put it into perspective for what it actually is. It's nice to be recognized by your peers. But that's it. It's not, it, it doesn't bring you anything of lasting value in terms of another job. And the older I get, the more I realize that this is a business, it is an industry. And regardless of awards or regardless of who has watched the show or who hasn't watched the show or what they think of it or how it's perceived, the important thing for me in my acting life is not the last job, it's the next job and how do you get it? And putting that into perspective that actually that's just your acting, that's the acting you do. There are all these other elements in life that are equally, if not more, so important. Um, I'm not saying that I'm turning acting into a hobby, but when you're young, it, 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 you can get carried away with yourself, especially when you're given these big roles and these awards and these things. You know, you're constantly be, being, uh, you have to be careful not to, not to uh, let, let all the smoke go up your backside. Do you know what I mean? No, but I, I, I know what you know what you mean, and that's more important. We're, we're nearly out of time, believe it or not. We've been talking for almost an hour. Mm -hmm. And I want to ask you two questions if I can, and then we'll hand it over to you, and you can, you can say what you, because you haven't really got a chance to say, I've been interrupting you most of the time. Is there, is there roles that are thrust upon you or that you accept that are more difficult and let me give you an example of that killing bono and i know half the world's population would like to but killing bono and um, was there was there a pressure to get it right because he's irish you're irish some people think he's a saint and, and lots of people think he's a saint in fairness so was there was there was there a nerd to please the home crowd? Uh, it certainly it was the it was the you know I I played people before that were alive and 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 um well who have just recently passed R V Bergen he was a marine I I had played him but nobody really knew who he was didn't know how he walked talked was that in Pacific yes yeah. but everybody knew how Bono walked, talked, his demeanors, his mannerisms. So again, just come back to the Artful Dodger thing. I went, it's, you can't copy another individual, but what you can hopefully get is their essence. So if they're a little bit aloof or they carry themselves a certain way or they, um, you know, you can copy their voice a little bit, but more the essence of the person. So it's like, you know, everybody has a dander. Everybody has a way they carry themselves. So you don't have to be imitating someone to go, what is it about that individual that if I adopt, I'll get away with giving an, an impression of who they are as opposed to, you know, being Rory <coughs> Brown and doing a, a, a bang on spitting, spitting image. It's more the essence that you want to get. I want, literally, I want to ask you two questions. You voiced... Bobby Sands in, in the Hitch Block documentary. And I would imagine that would be difficult um, to try and, and, and you mentioned about, about not imitating for the sake of imitation, but uh, was, was that a difficult role to play? Was it try, hard to capture the voice of somebody who, who is so iconic, so world? known and, and ultimately you know the end of the story Bobby dies well I, I what I loved about that job was actually getting to know the man and getting to know his writings and, and reading his diaries because I had never read them before and only when you read them do you really go you know are you sort of affected by how profound the man was in his writings and and his thought process and how selfless he was. Um, you know, it's humbling to see somebody give up or to learn that somebody can give up everything that they 
well, their life for something to believe in. Um, so it was a very, it was sensitive material. And I had to approach it like that. Did I copy his voice? No, no, not at all. Um, I just had to understand that this material was important, sensitive, and needed to be told, you know what I mean? So I just had to be authentic, I had to be real, and I had to be from, from Belfast, you know, as yeah. he was. So that was, that was, that's all I stuck by, you know? And, you know, I did know him, and I was, uh, I was around that period, um, and so I, I thought you, you just got it. You know, you just got it right. So, so well done, my head. Thank you. Plans for the future? I know you're sitting in Dublin and I'm keeping you back from going to do what you, what you have to do, but plans for the future? Plans for the future. Uh, keep being an actor. Look after my health. Try to travel a little bit. Um, and try to take it a day at a time. You know? Um, you know, I'm an actor, you know, I play roles. It's not the most important job in the world. I'm not saving lives. So I'm going to try and take life, wear life like a loose coat and travel a wee bit. That's what I'm going to do. Somebody who will watch this, uh, this program tonight will be thinking that they know someone who could be an actor, who should be an actor, they may feel they want to be an actor. Uh, do you give advice? And if you do give advice, what would you say to them? What would be that you're... I don't think there's any advice you can give other than if, if they enjoy it, they'll find a way. If they enjoy it, they'll find a way. Find somewhere like the Rainbow Factory. Find an amateur drama club. Find somewhere that's doing little plays. Doesn't matter how large or how small. And once you put your foot in that door, if you love it enough, you'll find a way. Do it. I suppose, you know, you're, you're young into your career. You know, people don't find the success that you have got. They don't find it until they're in their 50s or 60s and, and whatever else. Would you do it all again? I would do it all again. Some things differently. Some things differently. I would drink a lot less. Um, um, but in terms of career, I would, I would do the, I would have the same career because all the people that I met, you know, saying I would do it differently. That's like saying I would wish I had met different people. Yeah. And I can't do that. So my career was what it was and is what it is for a reason. And the most important thing about it is the characters I met along the way and the friendships I developed. The work, the work's the work, but the people, the people's what's the most important thing. And I think that's one of the most beautiful things as an actor. You get to meet different people and spend intense amounts of time with them and fall in love with some of them, hate some of them. Um, but regardless, you grow through it all. And uh, I wouldn't change it for the world. I'm going to let you go back to work, but I want to thank you again. You know, your, your days is are planned out for you and you're, you're busy and all of that. So thank you for being our guest. I, it's a fascinating interview. I Thanks. think you've answered a lot of questions. You've certainly answered a lot of questions for me. But Martin, Karma Yoga, thank you. Karma Yoga, thank you so much. God bless. Bye-bye.